All right, I invite you to be seated. What a great opportunity for us to give thanks to a God who comes alongside of us, to those who are messy, those who are in trouble, those who are addicted, those who are stuck, those who are in bondage, and oftentimes because of the own decisions that we make, God comes to us with an impossible power, an incredible power, an awesome power and strength to give us hope and life in His name. All right. Who's ready for school? Oh, come on, parents. I know you are way more ready than that. Huh? You guys are like, come on. Now, the kids, I get that response. I get that response. But I know many of you, you are pumped up and ready to go. So here we go. We get to launch in. We get to learn what is ahead of us in the upcoming year. We want to start thinking through that. We're, we're going to be into new habits, right? We got to get out of those summer habits. We got to get into those school habits and uh, rhythms and so forth. And so what are some things that we can keep on our minds and our hearts as we look to make these new rhythms of the school year and so forth? So that's what we want to take a look at today. Let's take a look at our theme verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul is declaring to the Corinthian church, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I invite you to read that with me. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. All right, we want to dig into this here today as we get ready for this school year. And I know for some of you, you've got kids who are heading into kindergarten and freshman and college, and away they go, and you have been carrying those Kleenexes with you wherever you go, and you'll probably need to for the next week or so. Yeah, that's a part of it, right? The joy of the seasons, the joy of the learning and the growth and the development. So as we think of a new school year, what kind of rhythms can we put into place? Now, I hope this is not brand new to you, but if you're brand new to us, this will be brand new to you. We've talked this way before. When we think about rhythms of life, when we think about being apprentices of Jesus Christ, we talk about these discipleship settings, rows, circles, arrows, and dots. There they are. Rows. You're doing it. Well done. Good work. You're sitting in the rows in worship together as the family of God. And we see that as incredibly important. Uh, But then we get to hear about circling up, the circles we need around us in life so that we can endure the hardships, that we can have the encouragement we need, so we keep doing the rows and the other things. The arrows, not only do we serve here within the church, but we look to serve in the community, right? Because we actually care about the people in our community. In our community, when the people of our community are thriving and doing well, we as a community thrive and do well. So how are we helping, serving, caring, loving, as Jesus calls us to? And then dots. Uh, that personal devotion time. How are we the prayer warriors? How are we taking time to be with God, to listen to the voice of our Heavenly Father, to be praying for others, to be in His Word, uh, the morning devotions, the evening devotions, the time of prayer. Maybe it's hym- hymnody as a family and so forth. Beautiful stuff that we get to do as dots because God cares about us individually, not just collectively. But yet He cares about us collectively as well as individually. Here's the challenge, though. I think in our minds, too often, we take these rows, circles, arrows, and dots, and all of a sudden we come up with this hierarchy, right? We're like rows, the most important thing. As long as I can check the box in rows for the week, I'm covered. I'm covered for the week, right? And maybe we even go rows, and then then let's do a little service, right? Let's do rows. Let's serve in the community. Maybe serve in the cafe and bake some cookies and so on. And so I'm good. But the circles and the dots, well, those are for those super Christian people, right? Those are for the Apostle Paul and Pastor and others, but, but, but not me. I got the rows and the arrows kind of down. I'm good there, right? And even our definition of rows, so often in our culture and society, it's like, well, as long as I'm doing it, what, once a month or so, I'm good, right? I'm checking the box enough. I'm good enough. But that's what, what we as leaders in this congregation are encouraging, and that's not what Jesus himself or his disciples encourage. In fact, they would encourage, let's be gathering together regularly, and regularly is more than once a month. It's pretty hard to have a great relationship if we only talk once a month. Uh, But instead, we really should be seeing these as equal, and that's why we see them in a row. Not a hierarchy, because worship is not more important than arrows or circles or dots, but really they fit together. 
rose, this worship right here, incredibly important. And it's not just about you. Maybe today you showed up not because you wanted to, but because somebody made you to. You should turn to that person right now and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making me do this. Because whether I like it or not, it's beneficial for me. This is like parents eat your vegetables, right? Eat your vegetables. Why? You don't have to like it, but I know it's good for you right? This is like commitments. You made a commitment. I'm going to help you follow through on the commitment because guess what? It's good for you. And when you do, there are blessings and benefits and encouragements and so on. Worship's the same way. So we encourage each other in worship. But then we've got to leave this place of this magnitude and we've got to start circling up with some people. We need people around us who are going to encourage us in our walk in life. Because Rose, although we do this once a week, we need something daily. And so that's our circles, somewhere else within the week to keep this flowing in a healthy way. And then arrows, we got to make sure that we're going out in the community and we're serving and we're caring. Here at church, here in our community. And then dots, again, it's not a once a week deal. This is something we get to do daily. And, and before you start to go, oh, great, now my checklist went from one thing to four things. This is terrible. He's just loaded it on like the school supply list, you know? Oh, my goodness. There's so much to do now. No, no, no. Deep breath. Deep breath. See, this is the invitation of God for a life of blessing. That's what this is. This is an invitation from God for you that if when we circle up, when we sit in rows, when we go out as arrows, and when we take that personal time of devotion, dots, when we're dots with God, our life is going to go better. All right, now I don't know about you, but when I hear this verse, we're going to keep exploring this, and we want to specifically start to take a look at circles for a moment. When I take a look at this verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, when Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ, isn't there a certain part of you that goes, what audacity? Huh? Like, really? Follow Paul? Or how about this one? You, you as, as your pastor, because that's actually what I am. It might be a shocker to some of you, but I'm a pastor. All right? Follow my example as I follow Christ. What audacity! But are you kidding me? But let's start to think through it for a minute. Why would Paul do this? Why would we maybe hear this for our lives here today? Can we put it in baseball terms for a minute? How many of you wish you could swing like Ty Cobb? I know. And anybody under the age of like 50 went, who? <laughs> uh, granted, I am under the age of 50. I just want to make sure I'm very clear here, okay? All right? Ty Cobb, Willie Mays, come on, we can list these guys. Wouldn't you love to be able to swing like them? But yet you've never met them. Have you seen a video? So what do we do? Oh, you mean those who can step up and go, you know what? I did witness Ty Cobb. I did witness Willie Mays. Let me show you how to do it. And we show. See, the people in Corinth, how many of them had met Jesus? Maybe a few, but many of them, no. No, because now Paul is heading into the foreign lands. He's going into Corinth, and he's going to say the same thing if you go to Philippi in chapter 3. He'll say the same thing. Be imitators of Christ as I'm an imitator of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. What audacity. But see, that's the reality. How many of us 2,000 years later have met Paul the apostle? Please don't raise your hand, or we, we really should have a conversation. And if you raise your hand, and that's really reality, we definitely need to have a conversation. Wow. Apostle Paul, haven't met him. We need to read his words. So how do I know what it's like to imitate Paul? Because we always have other people around us, don't we? That we get to be examples of. And we get to imitate. And in fact, that's the call for us. Can we live in a way that others can imitate us as we look to follow Christ? You may be the only Bible someone ever reads. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are people in our community that will never pick up the book, the Bible, and read about the love of Jesus in their life. But you, the way you live out your life as you go to the grocery store, as you're working out, as you're working— 
It, when you're in school and in class, you get to show that kind of love and care. You may be the only proclamation of Jesus a person ever receives. You may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And so if I, as your pastor, because I actually believe that you are here today because at least someone in your family somewhat respects me, otherwise you'd find somebody else to follow. But you also know that I'm not perfect, at least you should. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, Paul wasn't perfect. So what does this mean to be imitators? And I want to walk you through my life because I really want you to check your own heart and mind, and I think you're going to see some commonality. You're going to see some parallels that are going to help us as we march into rhythms for the school year. Okay? Meet my folks. Bill and Karen Hutton, precious people to me. Incredible. I get to be the man I am because those were my parents. They are my parents still, okay? They haven't passed away. Those are my parents. Now that's a pretty recent photo of them. So we got to go back in time a little bit because I didn't just come in and they looked like that, all right? I came into the world and they looked a little bit different. So let's go back in time a little bit. How about college days, huh? What a hunk. Man, there I am. I think I'm a freshman in college at that point, something like that. And uh, that's where Chrissy met me and just, I mean, it was like instant love. She just saw that face and just fell in love, end of story, right? <sighs> okay, that might not be the case. We took an entire class together and she didn't even know who I was, <laughs> all right? So mom and dad and the influence they had in my life. But, but it didn't start in college, did it? We got to go further back. So come on, here you go, high school soccer, huh? Here we go. Look at those curls, man. Something happens, something happens as we age, huh? High school's, but it didn't start in high school. We gotta go further back. How about confirmation? I am so thankful to my parents because they raised me in church that as I grew up, I got to do these incredible milestones in my life of faith building. So confirmation was a huge part of that. That's eighth grade right there, huh? Eighth grade, but it didn't start there. Because of who my parents are, it actually went even farther back. How about my baptism photo? There I am. I once was cute. <laughs> and believe it or not, that's my mom's twin sister, so it looks a lot like my mom in the photos we just saw, and that's my grandpa. My grandfather was my pastor when I grew up. See, this didn't just start with my parents. Faith in my family goes to my grandparents and my great-grandparents. And you want to know something? If you go all the way back into the 1800s, St. John's Lutheran Church in Seward, Nebraska, started in my family's living room, the Krogers. Wow. You mean all the way back, and we can go further back and so forth, because of faith passed down generation to generation to generation. I got to grow up two blocks away from my grandfather, who was my pastor. Is there any wonder I'm a pastor today? Huh? He took me on those hospital calls and shut-in visits, and he told me the elderly just loved youth, and I went along because I got a free ice cream cone afterwards. <laughs> there I am, sitting with Grandpa. And it wasn't just grandpa, it was my grandmother. As my grandfather said, behind every decent pastor is an incredible woman. My grandmother was an incredible woman. When I first started preaching, I would call grandma up and practice my sermons. And she was always so sweet. And even the criticisms would come across as so sweet. Oh, honey, I really liked how you tried to. <laughs> Thanks, grandma. But see, in my story, even though I have this incredible foundation of learning and growth and faith development, I also did things that weren't healthy. Like I went into ministry with a mindset of I just have to pour out my time and my energy to other people. I just care for other people and incredible things are going to happen. God's going to do incredible things, but I forgot to take care of this. Because I'm still a specially designed human being as well. And so I gained a ton of weight. I remember walking into a doctor one time, and I'm telling I'm like 30 years old at this point. I, I'm probably even a little bit younger than that. I might have been 28, 29. I'm only two, three years into ministry. So it happens fast when you don't take care of yourself. And I remember my doctor looking at me going, okay, it's time for blood pressure medication. It's time for cholesterol medication. I'm going, what? Those are for like 60 and 70 year olds. Not me. I'm, I'm only like 28. 
It's because you're not taking care of yourself. Not only did I have those health pieces, I also had depression. I fell into a depression, not once, but twice. Really deep depression. Because I wasn't caring for what God had gifted me. In my body, my intellect, all of this matters. But you know what I always had? Grandparents who loved me. Parents and family who came around side me. And throughout my life, I can point to different people. I bet you can do this too. Who you are today. Can you point to certain people that have mentored you in some very valuable moments in life? One of mine was Bruce Hartung, professor at Concordia Seminary. I remember coming off of Vicarage, and I had fallen into one of my first depressions without even knowing I was depressed at the time. And I reached out to him, and he loved me. See, instead of turning me away and chastising me, he loved me. And he helped me understand that I get to love myself as well. It, in fact, was him in one of my depressions while I'm in ministry as a pastor at my first call that he literally said to me, Aaron, he had already encouraged counseling a number of times, number of times, number of times. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, I'll get there. Have no fear. He said, Aaron, you are going this week to a counselor or I'm flying up there and I'm taking you. I went, Bruce, I'll go to a counselor. And I did. And I worked with that counselor through two depressions. And I have seen incredible healing because of people who come around Simon, because of the love of Jesus, because of incredible work of God. Mentors. Our very own director of ministries here, Michael Echocamp, has been a mentor of mine long before you even knew him. And then my wife and I learning what it's like to have circles around us, because it's not just about me. I'm married. I have a family. How do we do this together? How do we do this life together? We need families and people to do life together. I don't just get to be up on this stage and bring an energy and bring a compassion and a grace of Jesus when I don't experience that in life from others as well. See, I get to emulate that which is given to me. That's it. You get to emulate that which is given to you. So at our last congregation, we put together a group of people. We call it the Alleluia. That was the name, Alleluia Lutheran Church. Alleluia couples together, the Acts group. Here's a picture. This is one of our celebrations together. And you're going to notice here on the left, my oldest, who's a lot taller than that now, she's got that cool blue T-shirt on. There's Sammy. All right, you've got Chrissy right behind her in the black shade. She was pregnant with Zoe. And then I'm right behind her holding Eden, our little Eden beaten. All right, right there, and Zoe's not even in the world. Our Acts group, goofy group. We got to share life together. We got to pray for each other. We got to dig into God's word together. We got to do devotions together. Some of you know the value of a circle, and you have been there. You've lived it out. You have a circle right now that you are proud of, and you're like, yes, I know people are praying for me throughout the week because of my circle. And some of you just looked at those people and said thanks. And some of you, you don't know this. You don't know this life because I know I was afraid. What about if I start sharing with other people? They're not going to love me. They're not going to care. You know what I have found? The more I share my story, the more people go, wow, that's incredible. Thanks be to God for one. And you know what? I can actually relate a lot. Let me share you a little bit of my story. And all of a sudden, we start to realize we've got some commonalities in stories. We're all people who are sinners in need of a Savior. And guess what? The Savior has come. His name's Jesus. And we get to imitate that Jesus as we learn that Jesus from other people. Grandparents, parents, mentors, small groups, circling up. That's what we get to be. And then as we circle up and as we worship in rows, we are all the better as arrows into the community because we get to emulate that which has been shared to us, we get to be an example. Isn't that our theme verse for today? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Will you read it with me? Let's read it together. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now I start to get it. Do you start to get it? It's not that Paul's going, he's perfect. It's not that your pastor's saying he's perfect. Are you kidding? I mess it up all the time, and many of you know that. But what I hope you see in me, as a man who knows what it's like to be fallen, and yet knows the joy of Jesus because I'm forgiven, and hopefully a man who then walks out that forgiveness with you, and looks to reconcile in relationship with you, so that there's an example for us 
as we look to follow Christ. I try to do that with my wife, my children, my congregation, my community, my friends. And I have friends who love me for who I am. Can you believe that? They love me for who I am, not who I should be, not who they want me to be, not even who I want to be. They love me for who I am. They know some of my fallenness, and they still love me. Do you have those friends? Or do you have the friends that are your friends because life is going well? Because you keep paying for certain things. It's maybe a one-way relationship versus the two-way relationship. See, that's my heart and desire for you. As a congregation, we understand. As leaders in this place, we get this. We come to Rose. It's just as valuable as us circling up in each other's homes and coffee shops around the community. I need a circle. And I want you to know that joy as well. As well as arrows and dots. And if this is overwhelming for you today, here's my encouragement. What's the next one step you can take into this as a rhythm in this upcoming school? You have the perfect opportunity. You're setting your new habits. You're setting your new rhythms. What's the one piece? Has worship been a little less regular than you like? All right, great. Rose, let's get here every single week. Let's get here three out of four weeks. Trust me, you'll be blessed. You don't have a circle? We want to help you with that. And in fact, that's where I want to go. I want to give you a couple action steps of what we can do for circles here. What do small groups look like here? First of all, I want to define it for you. And, and I don't want to throw out arrows and dots. If, if arrows is your next step or dots is your next step, you can do it. And we want to walk with you. In fact, when you fill out the attendance booklets today, if you want to write one of those down, like I just need help with worship. All right, we're going to follow up with you. What do you mean? How does that help? Circle might be the way to help because you actually need friends here who are going to hold you accountable to be here. All right? Arrows, you want to serve in certain ways? You're going to hear about our new mission of the month for the month of August. Yay. Is it dots? And in fact, I find circles helps me with my dots. Again, holds me accountable. I don't do life well on my own. So what's a small group when we talk circle? Here at Christ Lincoln, we are defining small groups as a group that gathers routinely, like a family, to become more like Jesus and serve their neighbors. More like Jesus. Not more like Pastor Hutton, more like Jesus. Although I hope I can imitate a little bit. Just like Paul and just like you. Can we be imitators of Christ, to serve our neighbors, a group that gathers routinely like a family. So this doesn't mean just every six months. It's probably something pretty regularly, probably more than once a month. It's probably every other week, every week, somewhere in there. Not every day, not every day, but you're gathering regularly so you know the hurts and the joys. You're there praying. Maybe one week it's just a text message or an email, phone call, but another week it's in person. We also offer here as a part of small groups and circles, we have things called Bible classes and Bible studies. And I just wanted to define those because that's a little bit different definition than small groups. Bible classes and Bible studies can be small groups if led that way, but they aren't always, all right? Bible classes are a group that gathers around deliberate study of Scripture that is taught to them by a leader in a lecture or a monologue. Do you hear the difference? Kind of a lecture coming to you versus a small group as we participate together. Bible study is a group that gathers around deliberate study of Scripture with active involvement from the leader and learners, right? So you're actively doing it together. Small groups oftentimes include Bible studies in that small group life, life together. We can have Bible classes, and we can have them be like small groups. Yay! We have a bunch here, in fact. You can look those up. You can go to the welcome desk. If you're looking for a Bible class or a Bible study, we've got them. But we also want to help you with small groups. So what's the step you can take today? If you are going, man, I'm missing the small group. I'm missing the circle. I'm missing those friends, two-way relationship, to be in prayer together and to be encouraging each other. Because believe it or not, students, you're going into class. Parents have already told you this. Who you hang out with matters. Amen? Now, parents, you should have been all over that one. Right? Grandparents, you should have been all over that one. Who you hang out with matters. And it matters to us as adults. Amen? Amen? So let's circle up with some people that help point us in the right direction. All right, if you're looking for circles, you want to learn more about Circles at Christ Lincoln, visit our website. Okay, we've got a lot on our website, christlingon.org slash circles. All right? You can also talk to our director of adult discipleship, Aaron Hedlin, who would love to go more in depth on this topic with you. All right? We want to help you. We want you to thrive, because as you thrive, we thrive. As you thrive, our community thrives.
And as you circle up with others, you will thrive, and those around you will thrive. Let's take a look at our theme verse once again for today. Paul's helping us learn this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Let's read it together. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Do you remember Christ? Jesus? He circled up. He put 12 around him, and then 72 around him, and then he would feed 5,000 here. He was grouped up, but he had that small group, those 12, the women who followed and supported the ministry, because he was showing us something. If Jesus did it, probably pretty good if we do it. We'll probably learn something along the way, won't we? I have, and I continue to. So maybe you haven't met Jesus personally. Maybe you haven't met Paul personally. Maybe you haven't even met me personally. But take my word for it. This will bless you in this upcoming year. And may it be a blessed year. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite you to stand. This is a moment in our worship service that we go before God and we humble our hearts. Because although we're trying to imitate Christ to the world, although we're trying to follow examples in our lives, whether Paul, the Apostle Paul, or God's Holy Word, other disciples, our parents, grandparents, we make a mess. We just don't love the people we should be loving the way we should be loving them. We say things we shouldn't say. We judge those individuals that we've not even met by name. We've just seen them on the street, or we see them as we pass in a store or a hallway. And instead, maybe that's exactly the person that you get to imitate Christ to. And so we go before God in confession. And right now, we take a moment of silent confession before our Lord.